Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the annual Sussex Energy Group keynote lecture, this year presented by Professor Laura Diaz Anadon. My name is Marie Claire Brisbois, and I'm a lecturer in energy policy in the Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex, uh, and I'm co director of the Sussex Energy Group, together with Professor Benjamin Sovacool, who will chair the discussion, and Professor Carolina Rojas. For anyone unfamiliar with the Sussex Energy Group, we are one of the largest energy research groups in the social sciences in the world, with over 70 academic members from across disciplines at the university. We're involved in at least 25 funded projects, many of which are collaborations across institutions uh, and countries. Within SEG, we cover topics ranging from energy transitions to energy finance, energy justice, energy demand behaviors, the political economy of supp supp uh, supply technologies, smart infrastructure and di digitalization, uh, and much more. So if you're interested in any of that, please visit the SEG website um, after the talk and take a look. Um, so that's SEG, but we're here tonight to hear from Professor Laura Diaz Anadon. And Professor Anadon is the Professor of Climate Change Policy at the University of Cambridge and the Director of the Cambridge Centre for Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Government. Uh, she's also a research associate at the Balfour Centre for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, she's trained in both engineering and public policy and has far too many accolades for me to mention in full. So I'm just going to highlight three right now. She's worked on the UN Global Sustainable Development Report and on the Global Energy Assessment and is a lead author on the sixth assessment report of the IPCC Working Group 3 on climate change mitigation. Um, and we are very lucky to have her. So before I hand things over, I'll just present the schedule and some housekeeping. Professor Anadon will talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we'll share the recording later um, and on Spru's YouTube channel for anyone who can't make it. If you have questions, please post them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Benjamin will chair the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible, um, although some of them may be grouped together if they're similar. Uh, and you're welcome to post at any point throughout the presentation. Um, if you have any technical issues, please use the chat and we'll get those addressed. And if you would like to join the conversation on Twitter, we're using the hashtag SegKeynote, um, which will be posted in the chat so you can copy and paste it and tweet to your heart's content. Um, and with that, I present to you our 2021 Keynote speaker, Professor Laura Diaz Anadon on technological change in energy and green industrial policy. Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, let me start uh, by thanking uh, Professor Sovacol and, uh, and um, Dr. Boyce. Um, oh, let me see, sorry, start my video. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give this keynote lecture. Uh, it's really an honor. Um, I believe the last time I, um, I gave a lecture at Sussex, it was about four years ago, and I had the pleasure of being there in person. Um, so thank you for having me again. Over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'll talk a little bit about technological change in energy and in green industrial policy. I know we have people uh, from all over the world uh, watching the lecture. And I also know as, that as Emery Claire mentioned, there is a large group of researchers working on related topics in ASPRU and in uh, the University of Sussex itself. So obviously I won't be able to cover this huge topic, um, but I'm hoping that over the next 30 minutes, I'll give you a sense of some recent areas in which I think we've made progress and that hopefully will contribute to our ability to design um, better uh, recovery packages uh, using this uh, green industrial policy framing. So what is a big motivation for, I think, the work that I do and the work that many of us uh, do? And the motivation is that the current greenhouse gas emission trajectory we're in is not consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement, either the two degree goal or the aspirational 1.5 degree goal. The figure that we have on the right is one of many that have been produced indicating this, that you know, we are on something uh, along the lines of the 
uh, short yellow and orange lines, so much more in line with a three degree or a 2.5 degree um, temperature increases if, if we're lucky and not so much with a two degree or 1.5 degree. Since 1997, the global carbon intensity, um, the, namely the amount of CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions we produce per unit GDP, has actually been declining at around 1% per year. This is not enough, uh, as these uh, figures uh, suggest, to get us onto uh, a more sustainable path. We would need something like a tenfold increase in the rate of decrease of uh, carbon intensity to meet uh, the aspirational 1.5 degree goal. So we need to do much more. And it's not like governments haven't been doing anything. And, um, and, and I'll, as I will discuss in a second, uh, what we know is that we need action across uh, governments, private and finance, and civil society and individuals. Um, I will focus the conversation today around uh, government policy, which is the area that I've worked on the most. Um, but we clearly need action across all three areas. And governments across the world have been doing a lot in this space on, in the area of uh, decarbonization policies, so policies to, uh, to accelerate or enable the transition to a more sustainable set of um, energy technologies. This is uh, just a snapshot of um, some of the policies that have been put in place, in particular, demandful policies that have been put in place to spur energy innovation uh, across the world. And here I talk about energy innovation, not just to uh, describe research and development, but also the deployment and diffusion of uh, more sustainable and low carbon technologies. And what we can see in, the, in this picture, which is uh, just showing graphs from uh, REN21, is that over time we've seen an increase in the number of countries that have put in place uh, power regulatory policies. Uh, here we have, as of 2019, around 143 policies, uh, countries. Uh, these policies listed here include things like feeding tariffs, tax incentives, uh, renewable portfolio standards options. Uh, a lower number of countries have put in place policies related to transport and even less uh, uh, related to heating and cooling. And on the right hand side, we have carbon pricing policies. Uh, in, and in, in this graph, we have uh, countries that have put in place net zero binding targets as well as uh, countries that have uh, put in place either emissions trading schemes or carbon taxes. About 20% of uh, countries around the world have this type of policies. And the combination of these uh, demandful policies uh, uh, that are based on fiscal incentives or uh, regulatory incentives and the more market-based policies related to carbon prices has actually already contributed to a large extent to uh, one of the silver, uh, one of the um, one of the bright spots, one of the uh, of our ability to um, tackle the challenge of climate change, and this is that uh, this range of policies combined with entrepreneurship, finance, business innovation, uh, um, uh, action of citizens has led to big, uh, unprecedented uh, decreases in the cost of a lot of the technologies that we're going to need. Not all of them, but a lot of the technologies that we're going to need to address the challenge of climate change. In this slide, I just have a few of the um, uh, data that show the, the pace at which the cost of onshore uh, wind uh, capital cost has fallen down, crystalline solar PV module cost. Uh, so we have a few technologies here in the power generation space, some in the uh, transportation area. So we have lithium ion vehicle, vehicle, uh, vehicle weighted um, average prices offshore um, offshore wind as well as uh, the cost of uh, some um, um, use of products that uh, we use every day uh, such as LED lighting. So we see these really big decreases in many cases it's about 80 percent over the past eight to ten years and these big decreases have um, and many of us in, including people at Sussex of course have worked on some of the policy drivers of this. And this included some of these demand side policies that I had in the previous slide, but also a lot of policies on the technology push side on the R&D uh, uh, side of the spectrum. And these cost reductions have been large and um, most of them have really been uh, su surprising. They were not predicted by most of the experts. So this is good news. Um, 
Now, of course, uh, if we follow the debate, what we know is that even though we have a lot of the technologies we need and we've made a lot of progress in a lot of areas, uh, there are also, uh, we need more deployment of these technologies and most, more cost reductions in these technologies. And we also need uh, some new technologies that we don't yet have in early diffusion or early adoption. Uh, what I'm showing here on this slide is a, a stylized graph from the International Energy Agency. And the, the reason I put this up is that it, it shows nicely this idea that some technologies we have and some technologies we don't. Uh, we, again, need more deployment of the ones that we have, uh, and we need additional um, policies and, and institutions also for the new technologies that we don't yet have or that are in the prototype stage, for example, or in the early R&D stage, particularly in areas related to air travel or shipping or, or um, heavy industry, from cement and steel, for example. So what? So we have this, uh, you know, need to decarbonize to address the climate challenge. We're not doing enough. We need more. What I would like to uh, suggest here is that we have a, a wide range of literatures of evidence of analysis using a wide range of methods, uh, ranging from political science to public policy uh, to innovation studies. Um, uh, that suggests that there's a lot of value, particularly today, in the middle of this terrible. Uh, pandemic, which is preventing me from going over uh, uh, down south, uh, of emphasizing the competitiveness co-benefits of uh, some of the policies that we need to put in place to accelerate the deployment of the technologies that we already have and to develop and demonstrate and deploy the technologies that we don't yet have. There's, uh, you know, there's a confluence of, of factors that are leading us to, uh, to that, that I think mean that we need to emphasize these competitiveness co-benefits. So let me say a little bit more about this. Um, first of all, there is a body of research uh, right now that shows that the competitiveness co-benefits of climate change mitigation uh, of decarbonization policies shape public support and shape public opinion. Um, of course, there's uh, also research that suggests that, um, that the health co-benefits of reducing local air pollution, climate change mitigation, as well as benefits related to the improvement of ecosystems, biodiversity, uh, um, can change public opinion and help, uh, ha help the politics of having uh, aggr you know, aggressive policy, which is what we need to meet the climate change challenge. Now, in addition to a lot of the research using things like surveys uh, um, and other kind of experiments, uh, we also know that the co-benefits uh, in the form of competitiveness are particularly important today because we have a huge uh, economic uh, uh, harm that has been, um, that has been, that emerged through this pandemic. So in particular, you know, all this research shows that there's a lot of uh, support for policies that can increase the opportunities for people, for people who have low skills or who have been displaced from other jobs. So there are those benefits, but even more so today. And in addition, there's another uh, set of uh, literatures here, more from uh, innovation systems, uh, economics of innovation, um, uh, and other areas that shows that new players and actors can uh, counterbalance the power of the incumbents, which we have today in the energy sector. So the, the putting in place policies that create competitiveness co-benefits can lead to the uh, growth emergence uh, of new industries which, can, which create new actors, new winners in a sense, uh, forming new interest groups that can make policy sticky, that can again help sustain and ratchet up the effort to meet the climate change challenge and help overcome lock-in. Many uh, people both uh, you know, at Sussex and elsewhere and, uh, have contributed to this literature. And to me, the confluence of these two uh, literatures on the public support and on the uh, overcoming uh, the incumbent regime in a sense, means that the framing of green industrial policy uh, is particularly timely today uh, to help uh, design and uh, pass uh, policies that can get us out of the pandemic and also put us onto a more sustainable uh, path. We cannot let the, um, the, this opportunity pass. Uh, in a sense, the, the 2009 um, crisis was a missed opportunity. We could have done more um, to, uh, to, um, to shape the recovery and the um, policy packages 
to put us on a more sustainable low carbon path. But what is green industrial policy, right? And, and, and there's been a lot of work uh, on this. Uh, let me just get to a couple of definitions and then I'll start just with the basic industrial policy. Uh, many of you will know that during the 90s or early 2000s, just talking about industrial po policy was not very popular or something that serious people or, or, uh, did. Um, now, uh, you know, since the uh, late 2000s, early 2010, uh, this has changed quite a bit. Industrial policy, and this is a definition by uh, Altenburg and Roderick, who was my colleague at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, involves government actions that alter the structure of an economy, encouraging resources to move into particular sectors that are perceived to be uh, important for future development. These industrial sectors could be just more productive sectors. So this, uh, this industrial policy could um, just be a way of allocating funds to more productive sectors, but also other, uh, other uh, types of sectors that are seen as having benefits for society. And this could be sectors that can improve sustainability or advance other sustainable goals. Green industrial policy, and again, this is a definition by Altenburg and Roderick uh, that uh, was published in an OECD report, which has uh, from 2017. Are government measures aimed to accelerate the, the structural transformation towards a low carbon resource efficient economy? Now, this is very similar to the, the language that we use when we talk about climate change mitigation, uh, energy transition. And here, the kind of added piece is in ways that also enable productivity enhancements in the economy. And what I'm, I'm saying, and again, I, I know I'm not the only one uh, saying this, I'm not claiming uh, to be the first one saying this, is that in this particular situation, um, and, and given some of the social science research that I mentioned in the previous slide, it's really important to design uh, policies and to frame policies and policy packages uh, to try to achieve both goals. So this focus on GIP, on the green industrial policy, can help at least in the short to medium term with the politics, with the innovation that we need, um, and with the recovery from COVID. But uh, one thing that we've learned from a lot of these uh, literature streams that I mentioned is that green industrial policy needs to be designed to help the most vulnerable workers and communities. And I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, I'll talk about a few pieces of work in all of these areas, but these are basically four key principles that I think we've learned through, uh, you know, a lot of research uh, from um, our group here in Cambridge, but also around the world. Um, the first one is that we need to design green industrial policy to help or at least not harm the most vulnerable workers and communities to provide opportunities. Second, we need to account for the differential impacts of different uh, industrial policy um, tools. Uh, um, differential impacts across firms of different sizes and of different capabilities. So we're seeing a lot of evidence um, of this. Third, we need to consider the role that global value chains, complexity and sector can play in reaping competitiveness benefits in a sense to get, have realistic expectations of what a particular region or country might be able to achieve through green industrial policy in the form of competitiveness benefits. And then the fourth, um, the fourth key thing we, which we've learned from all the research on innovation studies and sustainability transitions and, and, and a wide range of policy evaluations is that we need to provide a long-term comprehensive framework considering the full innovation system and policy mixes. And this is something that I think is often forgotten, particularly in, these, uh, in, the, in the rush to design policy uh, instruments and funding on policy packages. We saw it most recently with uh, the, the, the green um, house scheme in the UK, which made it very hard for uh, some of these incentives to be used because the time scales that were put in place were so short. This is just one you know, recent example. So we know, uh, you know we, we've learned a few of these things and I'll just take you in turn through uh, these four points. And first, I wanted to, uh, to talk about a systematic review that I worked on with uh, Cristina Peñasco here at Cambridge and Elena Verdolini at uh, Brescia in Italy. And we were interested in this question of, of uh, trying to understand what we know about the impact that different uh, decarbonization policies, um, policy instrument types rather, uh, have on different uh, uh, policy goals, different outcomes. And we looked at seven different policy outcomes we looked at 10 different policy instruments 
And what we were trying to understand the extent to which we were getting uh, benefits in one area and possibly uh, not so many benefits in others. So what I'm showing you here, and, and I, I urge you to look at the paper uh, online if you're interested, is that a lot of the policy instruments that we looked at, and here we have nine instead of 10, because for the 10th policy instrument, we couldn't find any, uh, any literature on it. Generally speaking, when for these 10 poly nine policy instruments, we have a positive impact on deploying technologies, on deploying more sustainable technologies. So in blue, we have uh, papers that have found a positive impact on technology deployment. In gray, we have uh, papers, and, and the numbers are just counts of papers, that have found uh, no impact on technology deployment, and in orange, those that found uh, neg some negative impact on technology deployment. Now, the picture looks a little bit different when we looked at other outcomes, right? This, it, it looks very similar for environmental outcomes. So for environmental outcomes, technological effectiveness, largely speaking, most of the literature shows that these different policy instruments have a positive impact. When we go to competitiveness impacts, and uh, we see that several of the policies are associated with at least some negative competitiveness impacts. We can see that there's a lot of uh, a big mixture. So in some, uh, in most of the policies, we have uh, some uh, evaluations, assessments that identified a negative impact in one case and a positive impact, impact in another case. And what we see here is that this mixture of outcomes is due to two, uh, two things. One of them uh, is related to, uh, to the design um, of the policy. So how you design the policy is very important. How, you know, what the policy is, um, uh, what the policy mixes is also very important. And then the other thing is the methodology used to look at the, uh, at the problem. And we also have evidence that suggests that when we look at distributional Im impacts of a policy, and in this case, this might be higher energy costs for low income household, we also see uh, not, too, not too many papers, uh, admittedly, but we do have enough papers or several papers that identify the existence of some short-term negative impacts. And I think this gets uh, back to the question of uh, how we design uh, you know, green industrial policy packages to make sure that the most vulnerable communities and the most vulnerable workers do not uh, suffer, at least in the short uh, to medium term, from, uh, from this, uh, this uh, transition. Now, of course, uh, this is not looking at the whole system where you know, the damages from climate change uh, are going to be large. Uh, we, we're already suffering uh, from uh, um, local air pollution and the health damages from local air pollution and so forth. But uh, one thing that the literature on the pol political science and um, uh, innovation studies uh, that I've mentioned earlier uh, suggest that this, you know, it's not just unjust for the most vulnerable to pay the higher kind of upfront cost uh, from this, but also not sustainable for uh, ratcheting up policy efforts. So um, this is uh, one important thing. And for those of you who are interested in delving more deeply on uh, the results from this paper, there's an online tool and you can just, you know, play with it and select different outcomes. Uh, and uh, methods. So um, I'll now move on to something that came out out of uh, this uh, systematic literature review. And this is that we found that some of this competitiveness, uh, when, where we had some, competitive, some negative competitiveness and distributional impacts, we found that uh, often it was small firms or small and medium enterprises uh, that were those that uh, were more affected uh, by uh, by uh, this negative impact. In some cases, we didn't see a negative impact because of the design of the policy. So again, this is something that can be solved. Um, but we did find that, uh, that again and again, uh, small firms uh, were having, uh, were, uh, were suffering or had more negative impacts. So I'll, I'll spend now a little bit of time talking about some research that shows some ways in which different uh, green industrial policy instruments can help uh, small firms and in particular um, startups. So I'll focus on, on, on that part of clean recovery packages. Um, the one thing that I mentioned is that uh, some recent work uh, under the UK Alliance of Universities uh, led by the University of Oxford with contributions from Cam Cambridge also identified this area of uh, clean energy R&D 
uh, as one of the areas with a potentially higher um, payoff uh, in terms of recovery um, or green industrial policies as part of our recovery package. So let me talk a little bit about uh, what we know about how to help or how to uh, how to help uh, clean tech startups um, be more successful. We know that they can play an important role in both the energy transition and also in this idea of creating new opportunities for uh, new businesses and new, and new jobs. And uh, what we know, again, this is from a lot of literature on you know, finance and management and innovation systems, um, even though all startups face challenges, clean tech startups face uh, at least more than others. And uh, there, there are several reasons when you compare them to uh, startups in the IT sector, uh, for example, they have long technology development cycles, commoditized products, incumbents have direct environmental impacts. They also have a high, higher failure rate. And the question that, uh, you know, that some research that I worked on with uh, uh, Claudia Doblinger and Kavita Surana is how can policy uh, help support clean tech startups, innovate and uh, address climate and energy challenges. Of course, the question here is that uh, although a lot of the literature on open innovation, for example, and management was saying collaborating is great, collaborate with everybody, and small firms in general don't have the resources, the time to partner with everybody. So the question is, what are the partners that are more uh, useful uh, for startups? And we did some research on this uh, with a lot of data for the US where this is a very active area. And the key thing that uh, came out of this analysis of a wide range of collaborations, here we have a network um, image of the picture, is that technology-based um, um, partnerships with startups um, uh, where uh, increase both the patenting of startups and also um, follow-on funding, which was, by the way, a surprising uh, finding for us at the time. But then when we started thinking about this, we found that there were many reasons why actually the resources of government agencies and this case, in this case, it was mainly US national laboratories, Department of Defense and these sort of uh, partners. Um, and we found that the motivations of these national labs uh, as one key actor in the US were more aligned. They have a technology transfer mandate um, and, and they are working on the same problems. Um, private companies in turn, yes, they have better market linkages, but there's more of a power imbalance between small firms and uh, large private companies. And then there's the, the danger of opportunistic behavior. And then in terms of universities, you know, it's not that these uh, entities didn't play a role, but what we found is that um, they played a, a smaller role, possibly because of conflict of interest rules, misaligned incentives, limits to commercialization of federally funding research. The other, uh, the other um, um, information or the other insight that we found is that the government partners have complementary resources. They have expertise and networks. So a critical mass of employees uh, with insights on technology development uh, and more looking at future longer term developments. They also have a huge amount of infrastructure. DOE, the US Department of Energy has around 100 facilities available for external users. So they have a lot of infrastructure inventions available for licensing, and also uh, you know, investors generally take us an extra quality check this sort of interaction with government agencies. So we found that, that these small firms, clean tech uh, startups in the energy sector uh, can do better when they have these resources available to them. In a lot of countries throughout the world, including in the UK, uh, we, there isn't such a big network of national laboratories and public institutions that can play this role. Now we will move on to uh, another question uh, also related to the uh, funding for clean tech or energy R&D. Um, and, and this is the idea that, as I mentioned earlier, is considered a, a generally good thing. Different countries invest differently uh, in terms of the energy intensity, the R&D intensity of their GDP. Around the world, uh, as tracked by the International Energy Agency, there has been an increase in uh, public funding for RD uh, research development and demonstration up from 25 billion in 2015 to around 30 billion in, uh, uh, in 2019. This includes China and India, it doesn't include everything. And uh, the question is, well, everybody, you know, including my, my own work and, and colleagues is saying that we should invest more, that governments around the world should invest more in this. And, you know, the UK has a target to increase uh, R&D spending, the Biden administration also is uh, interested in this space. 
But the question is how? How do we uh, design public energy R&D programs to achieve also these green industrial policy uh, objective of increased competitiveness, increased opportunities for possibly uh, people that, uh, you know, that will, that are working in sectors that might uh, uh, not be uh, big for too long. And the one addition, one um, uh, program that actually did come out of the last recovery package in also in the US was the creation of a novel funding mechanism for energy uh, research and development. And this is ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Energy Agency, uh, Agency for Energy. Um, it was modeled after DARPA, very considered to be a very successful defense oriented energy funding agency in the US. It's a high risk, actively managed and mission oriented institution. Uh, so again, the question is how uh, to get to this mission oriented uh, innovation outcomes. And it does a lot of work uh, with industry uh, and it's been, uh, it's received uh, or invested uh, 3.1 billion uh, since 2009. Here you just have a schematic, this work was led by, uh, by um, Anna Goldstein. And what we were trying to understand here is the extent to which uh, the startup small firms funded in, by ARPA-E were doing well compared to those funded by other uh, Department of Energy funding programs, but also compared to other uh, firms. And I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of detail, but the, the main thing that I wanted to show you here is that uh, after the ARPA-E funding controlling for all sets of things and also compared to rejected applicants uh, to ARPA-E, so getting rid of some of the selection effects, uh, in, we found that ARPA-E applicants were patenting more after receiving the award. Um, now, this ARPA-E style funding is not supposed to uh, fill in all gaps. Uh, we found that the outcomes associated with business development were not consistently uh, greater, and that could be uh, explained by many things. We did find, by the way, that the firms that had received uh, funding were doing better than those that hadn't received funding which would mean that RPE helped with your technologies and get closer to commercialization to those that didn't apply for RPE funding. And, uh, and, but again, what we found is that what one can always, you know, uh, there are a lot of research that one could do, increasing the time frame for evaluating RPE beyond, you know, nine or 10 years, including additional metrics to those that we looked at, considering subsequent cohorts and awardees. So we just looked at fintech startups, one could look at university recipients and other types of recipients. And one could also do more qualitative work. So there's a lot of work that one could do on this, but one thing that uh, I think we, we found is that the, uh, this uh, research was consistent with previous research indicating that, uh, that this type of funding uh, can be very useful, but it needs to be complemented with additional demonstration and demand side policy. So to kind of bring to a close this uh, section on uh, the role of public policy and resources and funding on small firms, uh, we found that, again, these two papers combined with other papers that I'm citing here, suggest that there is an important role for uh, government-funded uh, partnerships and uh, resources for small firms in the energy sector. And we also found that additional support mechanisms, uh, demand pool, are needed in many areas. And this can take uh, the form of preferential financing, efficiency regulation, uh, deployment incentives, carbon pricing, and, and so forth. So let me move on to, and, and this is going to be um, the last point uh, I'm going to make. Um, the idea that when we think about green industrial policy, there's now a lot of research suggesting that not all technologies and countries are equal, and therefore uh, the ability of different countries to uh, reap the competitiveness benefits of green industrial policies uh, differs uh, widely. And what I'm showing you here is a graph in a paper led by Kavita Surana that came out, uh, that we worked on uh, last year that came out in uh, the summer. And here what you can see is uh, from left to right, uh, the complexity of different components in the wind supply chain. So one of the things we did here was to not just look at turbine manufacturers, but look at the whole supply chain. And what we found is that between 2006, which, are the, which is the graph on the top, 2016, which are the, you know, the charts at the bottom, we saw that a lot of countries were able to enter the manufacturing business for towers. So you see a lot of more lines in the uh, first kind of uh, column here in the bottom when compared to the top. 
for, for the more complex products, and, and uh, then there was much less change. So there are some components of the wind value chain are harder to, um, to get into and to manufacture, right? So the difficulty depends even within one sector by component. And this is something that, uh, again, is, there are uh, various groups here. Here, I just want to um, mention different research streams investigating the determinants of where different clean industries emerge. And some of them have looked within a particular technology, like the paper that I mentioned earlier on wind. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot of work um, on um, the economics of complexity. And here, I, I, there's the work of uh, Penny Mealy uh, that has done a lot of work on some of the uh, the factors um, that can lead or can help um, make it more likely or how you can try to understand uh, the likelihood that a country will be able to enter a new market. There's also work on design and manufacturing complexity, mass production, and on standardization doing using interacting on global innovation systems. And, and uh, here I'd like to mention Christian Benz. So there's a lot of research right now that can help us better design green industrial policies, again, with some real, more realistic or more informed, at least, expectations of the extent to which a set of policies or policy packages might be conducive to particular sectors or parts of a sectors to uh, grow or emerge. Again, this is something that we didn't have, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. And the last uh, piece I wanted to mention is, is goes back to the point about the long term, the need for a long term framework and a more holistic vision of the innovation system. This is a, a recent paper laid by uh, that I worked on led by uh, uh, Benedict Probst. And here what we were looking at uh, was the program uh, that India put in place as part of their solar mission to introduce local content requirements, LCRs on some of their uh, uh, solar options. And what we found is that this relatively short-term program, uh, which lasted three years, um, led to an increase in the cost of uh, power. So if there was a cost that you know then had to be paid. Um, but then because it was short-term, and, and also we looked at only short-term outcomes, of course, there wasn't a huge impact in terms of the, um, the, the economic co-benefits. So again, more work is needed. Uh, but I think this, uh, this brings into focus the need to look at a comprehensive set of policies. And again, there's been, I know there's a lot of work on policy mixes that can also uh, speak to this, uh, and also the need for more long-term um, policies and, and policy instruments. So let me conclude. I, I know I'm uh, just over time uh, with the, the few things I've tried to highlight today. And again, I wasn't trying to cover the whole field, but hopefully some of these messages are useful. First of all, we need to build a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient society. Climate change and the COVID crisis make government action even more urgent. Uh, we need a systemic, uh, purposeful policy effort that represents a step change. We need a big change in what we're doing. But again, we do have a lot of accumulated experience, in which I, I we try to highlight with the systematic review piece. Uh, green industrial policy, well designed, with the most vulnerable at the center can help build support and advance multiple societal goals, including the very pressing one of recovering. Um, I've talked about a couple of important mechanisms where we have a lot of kind of converging evidence about uh, where one can get both uh, client, you know, uh, in, uh, innovation in technologies we need for the transition, as well as uh, more productive industries or growing industries or opportunities. And I've talked about uh, mechanisms and resources for collaborations with small firms in the clean tech space, as well as mission-oriented R&D investments. And in the example of arpa -E, there's many things we need, and I just uh, put a couple of them here in the slide. And finally, uh, I think that, you know, one uh, big point, uh, which I think is also a very exciting area for additional research, is that green industrial policies need to consider differences across uh, different um, sectors, uh, countries, and prioritize and manage uh, with this knowledge about, uh, about what are some of these factors related to complexity, uh, related to customization uh, that uh, might uh, mediate the extent to which a particular country can, uh, can develop a thriving sector in one area. And of course, looking at this long-term uh, framework and the full innovation system, which again, we know, uh, you know, even though there's been a lot of work on this for uh, many, many years, 
to this day, it doesn't happen. And finally, thank you again for inviting me. And here uh, I have uh, a few pictures of the wonderful uh, collaborators that make uh, this work so interesting and exciting. Thank you, and possible. All right, I think it's my turn now. Well done, Professor Anadon. I'm, I'm clapping. <laughs> And we have no shortage of questions, 23 questions at the moment. So I'm not sure we'll be able to get to them all. Everyone, Professor Anadon graciously is taking time out of term break to help us today. So she has absolutely has to go leave at the end of the time of the talk, but let's see how many we can get through. So Professor Anadon, um, someone had a question regarding clarification. They said they missed what group of people need to become more competitive. Who is this group now that you recommended as an agency? Okay, uh, so what I, I'm talking about uh, new industries emerging and industries adapting to the new opportunities, uh, uh, new technologies, new business models that are needed for the transition. So I was talking uh, more about uh, business models and workers and, uh, and, and sectors of the economy. Thank you. Question from Alex Morrison, how can industrial policy succeed in the current situation if its mission is only to encourage resources to move into particular sectors that are perceived as desirable when so much needs to be done to shut down sectors that are harmful, destructive, or undesirable? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's an either or. I, I wasn't suggesting that, in, and, and by design or the definition of moving resources away from some sectors into others partly achieves what this uh, question is trying to do. You know, right now, as uh, probably most of you know, there are a lot of subsidies that still go into the fossil fuel industry. So one thing one could do is try to redirect those uh, to provide some of these incentives for the new, uh, you know, and more sustainable um, economy. So it's not, I don't see it as an either or. I think given the economic challenges posed by the pandemic and given the, some of these short-term impacts of the existing policies on some vulnerable parts of the population with a particular set of skills, that uh, putting in place policies that both accelerate the transition and provide opportunities for the most vulnerable is you know, one important thing to do. But yes, uh, you know, making sure um, that, uh, that subsidies to, uh, you know, fossil fuel industries uh, uh, don't, don't continue would also be, for example, a very important thing to do. Jacques Moss has a question about uh, the benefits of green industrial policy and kind of asking um, to the extent that it can be reaped by countries that are making low carbon technologies as opposed to successes purely in, de in deployment. And so I guess the question is more to what extent can countries making low carbon technologies reap those benefits from manufacturing? Making them, so yeah. Well, so I think what I what what um, partly this green industrial policy framing and the latter part of the talk, talking about some of the uh, indicators that we have or, or the research that we have uh, about the likelihood or, or what makes it easier for different types of countries to uh, uh, start exporting and manufacturing um, uh, some of these low carbon technologies. Um, we, you know, it was precisely getting at this that, you know, if you're a country that is already manufacturing these technologies, well, the, you know, to, uh, the objective would be to continue being competitive in those areas and perhaps to expand the set of low carbon technologies that you manufacture, right? So green industrial policy might also be a useful framing in that. I think that the kind of other side of the coin is for those countries that don't have the capabilities or, or the right set of skills to, um, to be big players or, or have economic uh, benefits and opportunities in uh, some of these clean tech sectors, I think the latter part of the talk is talking about, well, what, are, what is the low hanging fruit or where are the areas where you can start, right? So it's, you know, when we talk about re re green industrial policy, one question is what policy instruments, how do you design them? How do you uh, account for the most vulnerable? But then the question is given that budgets are not unlimited as we know, how do you sort of not, not pick technologies, but pick uh, a little bit what you focus on? And I think that the part on technology complexity can help there. All right, we have, I'm gonna combine these next two questions because they're somewhat similar. So Dr. Mark Hudson is asking, 
do you worry that green industrial policy is simply 1990s ecological modernization with better websites and more social media? Parentheses, I do. And yeah. Professor Ben Martin, who's here at Sussex, yeah. says, with the big increase in public funding for green R&D, how do we avoid the problems encountered with earlier grand challenges, Nixon's war on cancer, Reagan's Star Wars SDI, of researchers that just relabel or rebadge their proposed research? Mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, question was about the you know, 1990s and green industrial policy. And I think that precisely uh, we do have new insights, we do have new research uh, that we didn't have in the 1990s, right? That tells us a little bit about where can we actually make a difference? Where is the step? Where is the government policy? You know, what one could reasonably do going to get us something. Uh, I think what we don't want is some is countries saying, well, we're going to put huge subsidies on a particular technology on the, you know, with the rationale that yes, we want green energy, but also we want high tech jobs. And then there not being any chance of those jobs materializing. And now we know they don't always materialize, right? <laughs> Uh, so I think we do have additional uh, information. We might, you know, we would have different, policy, different policies, policies designed differently. Again, the RPI example, that's a new way of, of, of funding R&D, uh, for example. Um, so I do, it's a, you know, of course, all of these are good questions, but I do think that we know more and I think we can be a little bit more realistic about what can be done and how to design policies to not you know, hurt uh, uh, the most vulnerable uh, workers and communities. And on uh, Professor Martin's uh, question, uh, yes, it's something I've thought about a lot, you know, the rate at which one can ramp up uh, R&D investments. I am very familiar with uh, some of the work on the, uh, the, again, the war on cancer, the National Institutes of Health in the US and the funding uh, going up very rapidly and going, uh, you know, in some cases uh, to increases in salaries of researchers uh, and maybe some of the relabeling that uh, he mentioned. Um, I do think uh, I'm not suggesting that tomorrow we go from uh, you know from the 30 billion to 60 you know to 60 billion next year to double next year. I think it needs to be done in a you know gradual way, but you know still significant. Um, and, and that's precisely why I became uh, you know that very question is why I became very interested in how how should we uh, what are the the types of funding allocation the policy design details that increase the probability that we will not waste it. And that's why you know, we started working on this question about what are the key resources that startups need, right? And it, again, we were surprised by the results. And that's why I became interested in, for example, the question of what are we seeing uh, in terms of rigorous evaluation from these new institutions. So I, I completely agree that it is a concern. And that's why I think some of this uh, research, and again, others have contributed to this. I mentioned in the slide, the work of Sabrina Howell, um, looking at the impact of small business and innovation research funding on uh, uh, small firms in the US, and also it was a you know, positive impact. Um, so I, I think we know more about this and uh, partly diversifying the sort of mecha policy mechanisms we use uh, for this and assessing them and adopting is something that can help. Some really timely <laughs> questions. Um, Monica Alonso has said, Bill Gates has been in the news very recently. Do you agree with him that concerted government action is critical to addressing climate change? And if so, how aggressive should governments be? Um, I mean, I, I agree that aggressive government action is essential. You know, anyone who sees those trajectories can see that we need big changes. And again, as I uh, mentioned earlier, even though I focus on policy, we need to big changes across the board. So civil society and movements are also very important. Uh, how aggressive, again, is, is this balance, right? Of, uh, you know, how do you make sure, you know, it's not that I, I'm not under the, um, the impression that we can be 100% efficient and optimal. I think we're, I'm trying to learn, and I think we're all trying to learn what sort of things can increase the probability that again, we don't hurt the most vulnerable, we don't waste too much money and, and we get there and we learn. One key thing, is evaluating and assessing how we're doing. Uh, but I think some of these increases in R&D, increases in demonstration, uh, you know, continued support for early deployment in, in different, you know, including uh, efficiency standards, including, you know, uh, you, know, carbon, you know, greater carbon prices, and including other demand policy instruments. Uh, we absolutely, I agree with that part of uh, uh, 
uh, what Bill Gates has uh, been talking about. A nice question about ARPA E from Matt Bilson. Matt has asked, what factors kind of determine why it's been successful? Is it that it's an actively managed program or that it's cross fertilizing staff coming from non governmental backgrounds? What do you attribute to its success? There's a lot of work on this. There's, you know, the, you know, some other work that Anna Golsin has done, the National Academies and Erica Fuchs and others have done some work on this. So there's uh, there are a few things. It's very hard, hard to isolate it, right? Uh, but some of the uh, some of the the um, some of this work uh, suggests that it's a combination. That is the you know the selection um, effect, the fact that the RPI managers have more discretion and they you know they can just you know they still have a, a peer review process, but then they have discretion to perhaps award the project even if somebody some project has a very low score, right? Because they think. Again, this high risk, high reward mentality. Um, it also has uh, a lot of programs that try to connect uh, the, you know, the projects to industry. They have shows, so they have, there's also a networking part of ARPA E, and there's also the actively managed part. This, which this uh, person asked about, which you know they they have milestones, and it's not that you don't meet a milestone and you're out. Uh, it can be revised, right? You might, you know, you might still be out, but there there is this uh, this um, this um, Management. And there's also the type of people that get attracted to it, right? Is that the the hiring process is faster? They attract, you know, people with maybe different backgrounds from those that were making those sorts of decisions in the past. So it's very hard to disentangle all these things, but it could be a combination of those four things and perhaps even more. Neil McCulloch has a very specific question about the GIP activities, the GIP activities. If there were two GIP activities that you would like to see more of, what would they be? If there were the two GIP activities that you think are poor value for money, which would they be? Hmm. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, <laughs> with the ones that I think would be high value for money. Uh, and those I, I already mentioned the first one, which is this sort of resources for small firms in the kind of energy clean tech space, either in the form of programs for, you know, infrastructure, you know, uh, ut uh, facilities, expertise of, you know, scientists and small grants and, and that sort of thing. I think we do have a lot of evidence uh, about those. Um, I, I do think uh, that some of the kind of preferential financing for, you know, clean infrastructure projects uh, is also one that because of the scale and the terms of uh, kind of employment co-benefits, uh, you know, and, and the fact that we have a lot of infrastructure that needs to be upgraded anyway, because we need to adapt to climate change already. Um, so, so I do think that some of the kind of big projects, uh, you know, green project financing uh, might uh, be, you know, two that are high on the top of the list. But again, the, the danger, particularly with the latter um, type of uh, pro project, is if it's done too quickly, right? Some of these things is good, you know, we need recovery quickly. Yes, it, clearly it's very important, but there's also the danger that when you require things to happen too quickly, you end up doing projects where there's not much learning or things haven't been sufficiently assessed or the benefits, you know, uh, could be, you know, shared more widely. So uh, in terms of green industrial policy, low value for money projects, I mean, if one really takes to heart a lot of things that we've learned over the past 15 years or so, then I think one can define different things that would fall within that green industrial policy definition, uh, which, you know, again, I, I don't see as super diff different from, you know, trying to get decarbonization, paying attention to uh, opportunities for uh, vulnerable workers. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I can give you a particular example. It would be one of those policies, but badly designed. So without, for example, you know, specific carve outs or, or policies addressing the fact that a lot of small firms might not have the resources, the funding, the time to be able to apply for something like that. So that would be a badly designed green industrial policy, one that only, you know, allows, uh, you know, a, a small set of actors to engage because of the time or the conditions. We have a flourishing of questions. We've cleared almost 10. We have 34 more, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to combine Nuno Bento from Portugal says hello, and they've got a question yeah. that's very similar to some of the others. So Nuno has talked about what is the most promising policy strategy that you see? Kino Haverkamp has a similar question, kind of about what's the role of institutional settings that may favor particular types of policy measures? And this is also somewhat 
close to David Walren's question, which is more about how in most countries, government resources are constrained. Governments can't do everything at once. What's the best way to do limited resources to maximize the best outcomes? I see all those questions kind of talking about institutional settings. So I guess, you know, what do we do there and what are your preferred policy prescriptions, Professor? Um, uh, hi, Nuno. Uh, <laughs> the institutions matter a lot in this. And one thing that uh, I found very interesting over the past you know, 10 years or so, trying to think a little bit about policy design is how little we know about the impact of all of these policies. So it's really a struggle to get any data <laughs> to do this. And one you know, thing in terms of having institutions that are able to make these really difficult decisions, right? About how you design a policy, how do you sign a policy package, how you design, uh, you know, how, uh, how you run selection processes, how you evaluate it, is to actually even think about those questions, right? So in a lot of places, there isn't the expertise or the time or the incentives to do this in some places, you know, you know, and I, I, I there was some work that I did a few years ago uh, in China uh, with, with colleagues that are not Tsinghua. And what we found is that in that setting and that, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of incentive to, um, you know, to fail, right? So, you know, all programs, we looked at the, you know, the rating of all, you know, projects that these were R&D projects and it was 96% success, 96% suggest, uh, uh, achieve what they were meant to achieve in innovation that seems a little bit too high and and I think the the reason why we had that sort of answer was that there weren't incentives for failure so having a an institutional um, um, setting in which actually thinking about these uh, issues of you know what is realistic or uh, how do we design this how do we evaluate it how to change it uh, would be you know my number one thing of course this takes time and of course you know we are we have this, uh, you know, really pressing crisis right now. Uh, but again, in my experience, in many places, uh, people who are, you know, it's not that people are not smart. It's, they're not, it's not that people in these sort of roles don't want to do the best thing. It's that there isn't the time or the resources or the you know, incentives uh, to do this sort of thing. Um, that's uh, one <laughs> thing. Um, for countries who don't have, you know, every country, you know, we in every country we we don't have, you know, we can't do everything. Of course, some countries can do more because they have a bigger economy and and, and bigger resources. So these questions about uh, complexity, customization, global innovation systems, what is more, uh, you know, how you know, given the capabilities one has, a country has, you know, what seems more reasonable, where should the, a critical mass of resources be devoted? And yes, we cannot be too prescriptive, but how can one cajole resources? Then it becomes more pressing for smaller economies, right? Because you really can't do everything in your have smaller economies. So I think these sort of considerations uh, become even more important there. Oh, so many questions. I'm just gonna give you two more and then we're, we're done, Professor Adedon, because I think we can go on for another hour. Um, <laughs> and I'll give them to you both at once so that you yes. can decide how long. Um, Rainer Quitzo from Germany has just talked about generalizability from, of results and kind of they're saying their understanding is that capacities are organized in the U.S. a very particular way. They may be organized differently elsewhere. So how much can we really learn from these U.S. results in other contexts? And then this is Sussex. So I have to go with this question from Dr. Andrea Brock, who says that we have a lot of evidence that talks about absolute decoupling of emissions and growth and how that's impossible. And really what we need to do is get away from growth oriented economies. What are your thoughts on the need for a degrowth economy that breaks the fundamental logic of growth, challenging state power and corporate power, and which may need different principles? An easy question for you. Very, very easy question, of course. Yes. Yeah, so I'll start with the, with uh, Rainer Quitzo's question about generalizability. Um, I, I do think um, you know, one thing, let me put the, uh, start with the example of the government uh, startup alliance work where we had the you know, national labs and the clean tech startup um, partnering and their resources being particularly useful. I do think um, that the resources useful for uh, startups may be something that would apply elsewhere too. Now, not other places, I mean, uh, Germany, for example, has the, you know, the different, you know, Fraunhofer, Max Planck, so they have a different set of institutions that might play a role similar to, uh, or, you know, not the same, but, you know, that could play a role 
similar to the one the national labs um, are playing. But other countries, as I indicated in my talk, like the UK, don't have something similar, right? So clearly, uh, I'm, I agree with the premise of the question, those results don't apply everywhere. I do think we can uh, at least get some sense of the, you know, get the combination of that paper with some of these other papers that I mentioned do suggest that small firms and startups are, you know, and this is not very surprising, right, are very resource constrained, both in terms of knowledge, people, and funding. So uh, I do think that uh, has uh, also uh, a role elsewhere. Now, what is very different uh, in, in the US is, of course, the, the kind of type of venture capital funding environment. It's growing in other places, in the UK, in you know parts of Europe, but it's still not there. Uh, that, that is something where I think it would be very, really interesting to do something uh, here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's certainly a, an area in which I think it would be really interesting to do future research. On the, on the RPA, uh, you, know, you know, we wrote some, uh, my co-authors and I wrote uh, evidence to the UK Parliament who was considering an RPA type agency. And, and one of the things we talked about was the, the need to focus on you know, a mission as opposed to you know, everything. And I think that's partly related to the fact that, you know, even though the UK is a big economy, it is not as big as the US, for example. So I think there are clear uh, implications for, you know, the external validity or transferability, as I think he was saying, of our results. Um, but one key uh, bottleneck is actually the data that is available. So, you know, we were able to get data on these things. It would be great if governments in Europe were able to, you know, share data on some of the other things. And did you have time for the degrowth question, Laura? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was. It wasn't on purpose. Yes, I just. <laughs> um, yes. I, yeah, I do have to go with my three kids at some point. But um, so yeah, um, I think because of the urgency of uh, the challenge and the recovery, uh, you know, the pandemic, I do think it's important, at least as I indicated in the short to medium term, to try to. You know, get something that maybe we can get more agreement on, you know, where we can get the politics uh, working and support uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, you know, whether or not, uh, so I, I'm not sure right now we would get very far designing these recovery policies, uh, you know, the way we want them to be if we emphasize right now degrowth, because right now, you know, there are a lot of people without jobs, without livelihoods, without, you know, electricity <laughs> and, and things like this. Uh, but it is, of course, a, a really uh, important uh, question, and uh, and and I think it's something that I will have to, uh, you know, certainly, you know, academics thinking about these issues, but also, you know, civil society and you know, and and people pushing it up the the uh, agenda right now. Again, because the huge suffering that you know we're seeing, uh, you know, further cutting jobs for, you know, people might not be uh, something that can get the right structures that we need for the low carbon infrastructure uh, and, and some of the, you know, redirection that we need for a lot of the uh, industry that is now very, um, you know, energy intensive and emitting a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Professor Randall, thank you so much. We're only five minutes over, thank goodness, but <laughs> thank you everyone. Let's give her a round of applause. We will oh, be posting a recording of the talk. Um, and for those of you who like the Sussex Energy Group, you can join our newsletter or our mailing list. You can see a link to the group there, or you can follow us on Twitter, also a link there. But really, Professor Anadon, an amazing talk. No, so many thanks, thanks to you for inviting me, and thanks for the great questions. You have a wonderful evening with your children. <laughs> Bye.